All right, welcome everybody. Tonight is the 2nd of November in Dallas, and this is Dallas uh, Personal Robotics Group. We uh, each Tuesday night have a meeting where we go around the table and talk about the robots that we've been working on or ideas we've found and whatever other random things seem to fit the topic. Um, so we're going to follow that model tonight. And uh, well, without further ado, we will get an update first from Murray in uh, New Zealand. And then uh, I will give something and then David Anderson, then Doug P, and then whoever else is next will be next. So Mr. Murray. Uh, hello. Um, over on the personal robotics chat board on Discord, we have a project that John of your group has been wanting for a while, and it's actually in motion now. We've got a guy in upstate New York and one guy from Seattle, from I believe the Seattle Robotics Group. And I can't give names because that's giving people's names away. I could give the handles on, but it doesn't really matter. Point is, is there's um, four of us. And um, We've got one guy, Alexander, in upstate New York, who is working on the uh, the RP2040 C and C sharp, or not C sharp, C plus um, plus motor controller code, and has also contributed the motor controller schematic. And this is a five amp per channel um, I squared C motor controller. And so he's done the basic schematic of the motor controller and the RP2040 side of things. And John is working on the KiCad conversion of that into a KiCad file, which will probably end up going to easy EDA for the actual build. Um, we're gonna have um, a USB connector on there so that it can be reprogrammed. And of course, for all those who have been following my progress or desires anyway, I've been trying to get an I squared C slave in MicroPython for well over a year, and this is actually looking to happen. Um, the guy that we've got from Seattle, um, Adam, who's jumped in, he's actually read cover to cover the entire RP2040 spec, and he's fairly confident that he'll be able to provide a MicroPython implementation to effectively replace the C, C++ one that would be the default. So we have a fallback, which is the one that um, will be um, delivered quickly, but if he's capable of creating the micro Python version, I would effectively be charged with writing the the actual library to support that on the client. So basically, client library, and we. It turns out the board's turning quite interesting because it'll be both delivered as a C plus plus. Arduino style code, but it will be reprogrammable in MicroPython and it will have encoder support on board using the PIO part of the RP2040. So it'll, and according to Adam, I think, I can't remember the numbers, but the PIO can easily, easily, he was saying, I can't remember, 12 megahertz or something. Like, put it this way, the encoder, there's not an encoder on the planet could overrun this thing. It's got plenty of performance. Um, and so we'll have, uh, two language implementation. It's going to have a USB port for reprogramming. It'll have extra pins broken out onto the board so you can solder up some sensors or whatever. It'll have the ability to have the on in the MicroPython side of things, it'll have the PID controller on the board if you like, as well as encoder support. And this is five amps per channel, and the whole project is going to be open source. So I think our target price is something around $20 a board to have it built for us um, out of JCLCPD, whatever. I can never remember that acronym. But in any case, um, the project's coming along, and um, I'm probably going to be the slow one because my this month of November for me is shot in terms of schedule. But um, it's coming along, and I don't see any particular barriers. Um, according to Adam, he sees the RP2040 as a real, op as a real possibility for an I squared C slave implementation in MicroPython, which would be, apart from the STM32, the only other one that we've seen on, you know, anywhere. Um, I think that the, um, the Teensy may be able to, but I haven't actually found any implementation of that yet. But uh, the project's coming along, and we're hoping, I don't know if it'd be before Christmas, that we'd actually have a running version of it on a board. But um, it seems like there's a fair bit of kind of oomph um, and momentum in the in the chat right now and like they're just back and forth today talking about the pc board and the versions that john's posted in, in KiCad, and so i'm quite optimistic about that project actually 
um, like coming to a you know finish maybe this year. And apart from that, um, I am, yeah, not, there's nothing much to report on my my Python OS. I basically made some mistakes in how I was doing the motor directives. Basically, I send messages around on my message bus, and the message contains an event type, like let's say, you know, move forward at half speed or whatever. And I've made the payload on those messages able to handle a direction enumerator or enumeration, a speed enumeration, so you can have the standard Chad burn, you know, half full, um, dead slow, the kind of things you'd see on the old ships. So those can be sent as um, as directives to the motor controller, and you can say uh, ahead or astern, and dead ahead, half speed, you know, kind of thing, just like a ship, and. Uh, there's no point in passing around numbers, really. I mean, on a robot like this, saying I want to go at 30% or 35% or whatever, it, it doesn't mean anything. It's like you're either going dead slow because you're crawling up to something or you're going, you know, a third or a half or whatever. So I'm just kind of passing those messages around. And I was doing it all wrong. So I'm just rewriting that now and um, kind of getting there. Um, and I keep putting off this idea that I was going to do a demo video or something, but I just haven't had the time, frankly. So apart from that, um, I think everything else is, yeah, that's about it from here. Done. I tried to talk as long as possible, Carl. <laughs> hey, no problem. As you may have noticed, I, I actually had time for another scoop of ice cream or two, so. Uh, Carl, uh, if I could uh, interrupt, uh, I sure. noticed that the Mr. Merriam has joined us. Arud, uh -huh. are you there? So we have a new um, participant this evening. Hmm. I thought I had actually twisted his arm to try to get him to come. So, oh, good job. I th I thought we've seen his name before, but uh, if first time welcome, that's great. There um, he is. Just oh hi, yeah. Good, your okay. mic. Your mic good is mind. muted. Good, your mic is muted. Audio is not working, Rude. Okay, let's try it with turning the microphone on. Does that, oh, that work? <laughs> Amazing. Presto. Well, great to see you here. Yeah. Got a, a nudge from David to, to come by and join and see what was going on. So I thought I'd follow up on it and see what happens. Welcome. Well, hopefully we have enough interesting things to catch your attention. <laughs> so everybody be on good behavior. <laughs> no. I'm gonna blank my video again because I'm eating supper and I don't want to look like a slob here. No problem. Paying attention. Yeah, and, and do know that we are we do record these things. So uh, if if you don't want to be recorded, put a note in Slack and we'll turn it off, or uh, just don't say anything. But either way, I don't care about the recording. Okay, most of it, we're all in the same category, so good deal. Okay. Um, um, paying attention. No worries. Well, with that, then um, I'm going to jump right in. Uh, again, I'm next, and I think David Anderson and Doug Parody. So, um, so I'm going to show. I actually did something related to robots uh, this last week, remarkably. Uh, although, uh, when you see what it is, I don't know if the word "remarkable" is really worth using like that. But basically. Um, what I did was, uh, and let me change the camera. Uh, oops, not that way. Uh, so there's a little backstory to this. I have a, uh, some cousins or nephews or a mix of that who are um, 10. And I bought for them, each of them, a, uh, an M block STEM robot, 60 or 80 bucks. It's a kind of nice little deal. It's, it's all connectorized and it's got no encoders, but uh, it's got a nice set of uh, different options and things. And, uh, and I, I printed up this kind of sumo course and we each have a copy so they can practice in their own homes. And uh, so this Halloween uh, the other day, uh, we, we tried to try to get them together so we could have our first little sumo battle. Um, well, so of course, uh, I, I thought it was Halloween, so I had to do something special uh, with mine. So um, we'll come back to it in a minute. But, you know, it's got your basic um, 
basic behaviors here, you know, for, for STEM robots. So hit the button to get it started. It looks around, it sees something, and uh, it sees the tripod. So it's a little too close to the edge of the world there. But if we get it out, you know, so it seems to work okay. It sees something and goes straight through it. Say what? Now you said it sees something, and I said, well, I need decides to go straight through it. That's right. That's right. So, um, so anyhow, uh, you know, it's not that much of a demo, but I thought that I would show some interesting things uh, under the covers. And um, the first thing I'll share is on the decoration. Uh, so that little bit that I put in the front, um, and we'll come back to that in a minute because it's amusing in its own right. Why is it flashing? That's not good. Okay, now it's not flashing. Okay, so it started life as this uh, $3 plastic uh, cup from Walmart. And, you know, regular old hacksaw took the back off, so that's cool. And then I thought, well, how am I going to cut off the rest of it? So, you know, I had these two different tools, and I'd try. Anybody care to guess as to which tool worked better than the other? No guesses. Um, we'll come Dremel. back. Hmm? The Dremel is my guess. Okay, Kareem would, would guess the Dremel, um, and that would not be right because it didn't have enough clearance. And then there's another problem that was amusing. So anyhow, a hacksaw got it this far, and then this thing let me take off. Uh, the, the blade was thin enough that I could cut out the base, so it got it to this point. And uh, but that's still, you know, it needs to get more compact. So get out the ruler. It's got to have the jaw cut off so that the uh, optical sense, the uh, IR sensors can have clearance. And skill saw, which worked good before. Does anybody see a problem with this? It's just, yeah, that's real. It just melts that's real common. It just melts and reforms behind yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So I took all the time to go all the way through the jawline, and then the piece didn't fall off. And I looked, and it glued itself back together again. So, yeah, yep, yeah. Live and learn. All right. So, uh, you know, it's all about STEM. So I thought I'd try this tool. Why not try this tool? What could go wrong? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> Kareem's laughing. David. Those don't dissipate heat at all. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Well, it was a funny. Man but, saw would work best. But it it did give a nice um, a nice extra decoration to the jawline because you know there was there wasn't enough clearance to get it past the arm, so it it wasn't even going straight. But it didn't matter because it glued it back and it adds more character to the you know decrepit face. And so at the end of the day, what worked well was not a bandsaw but a hacksaw. And, uh, you know, that got that there and then opened up the eyes with a growing set of drill bits. And then I didn't have a big enough bit. So this, this grinder worked pretty well. And, uh, well, anyhow, so that, that was, that was that. Um, but the next little bit about the construction is, is something I wanted to share. So, uh, you know, for years now, for years, I, I've been hearing the word subsumption architecture, right? Subsumption <laughs> architecture. And I thought, how simple, how simple can I make something and still have it formally be classified as a subsumption architecture? So, um, you know, I have this little block diagram and it's not into subsumption yet, but it's, this la it's actually kind of cool. I have to say the scratch language, it's visual. It's not rich enough, so you don't want to do anything too serious, but you know, when, when it starts up, I initialize stuff. I have a block like that. Then forever, it'll just check these buttons. And if none of the, if those will press, it'll go in the right mode. Otherwise, it'll let you drive around. So, okay. Just interrupt me anytime if you have questions. This is really complicated. Stuff here. And then the top level of sumo fight mode. All right. So, you know, you enter in the mode, you want to start off clean, so I initialize. And when you lean it, leave it, you want to put things back in order, so I initialize again. But in the middle, it just repeats until you push the button, C means stop. And it has these two parts. It has sample sensors and compute behavior requests, and then arbitrate behavior requests and perform highest priority behavior. So I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm following the rules on this or not yet, but... If we drill into that, here's the highly evolved arbitrate behavior construct. So 
if the mode request is to escape, then we'll escape. Otherwise, if the mode request is to push the enemy bot, so it'll go forward. Otherwise, it does this. So I figure that um, because it's it's just going through this, sampling the sensors and doing this arbitration, um, in a way, the escape behavior will subsume the push forward, and the push forward will subsume the other one. So I figured maybe this counts, maybe not. I don't know. Um, and then this is really so fast your seatbelts because we're going to look at the mode for push enemy bot forward. Anybody want to care to guess how complicated it is? Okay, that's it. And then um, the uh, the other behavior we have is find enemy bot. Let's look at that one. <laughs> okay, so uh, anyhow, and then the escape behavior. This is this is absolutely ballistic, but uh, you know it just. Uh, it's kind of fancy enough that if it, if both sensors, if it hits the line square on, then it backs up straight. If it hits one or the other, then it turns, backs and turns one way or the other. But And then sampling sensors, so it just sets flags. And uh, anyhow, so that's all I had to do. And that's, uh, so my question is, in, this, in the world of subsumption architectures, is this about as simple as you can get? Does it count? Is it or is it too trivially simple and I should just go away? Looks like subsumption to me. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I finally I finally caught up with a subsumption architecture and I can actually and, and Carl, uh, I wrote it in the same language which you did. You did? <laughs> in the same language which you did with this with the things which the you scratch kind of language. That's what I wrote my first subsumption to. Kumar, this is awesome. This is why we went. What, what level degree did you get, Kumar? I had, I had just uh, uh, one behavior, which is light is there, high priority, do something, no light, just keep moving forward. But the language in which I wrote is exactly the language which you use, which is scratch. scratch. And I said, why do I need anything more complicated, like interrupt driven or anything? It's just a prioritization of behaviors. I did exactly what you did on my cute bot, which is the itsy bitsy robot, which I had sent a video across to some people, but uh, that's what I did. I think Kumar, I should just give up now. <laughs> give up on? Yeah, give up all this Python crap I've been doing for the last few years. Ridiculous. And, and if I may add to that, uh, 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 one of the things which um, uh, Murray mentioned is you have a behavior and you have a counter behavior and they need to be in back uh, with know, one another so that, that was means, david's idea having two encounter pose to each other that kind of balance and, and then the next behavior which i was trying to implement was go search this cone and then i said if i don't have a counter pose behavior i'll go and crash into the cone so the counter pose behavior is when this cone becomes very close to me stop so I don't know whether that's also subsumption and counterpose as in subsumption, but since we brought up this discussion, I thought I'll just raise it over here. Well, this might be a good time to to uh, invite our guests to talk to us about bee trees, because I think that they solve the same problem. Okay, let, we, let's do that. But before we leave this topic, there's one question that nobody's asked. So go ahead, go ahead, Rude. Bee trees. If you, on demand, if you want. I mean, just. I'll ask the question first, Carl. Did it work? Oh, it worked great. But the, the president of DPRG did not win any of the bouts. Can anybody not guess? One. <laughs> his, his nephew, well, actually, his nephew's dad, who's a software QA for American Airlines, uh, kind of kind of, it didn't have as good of an algorithm. It wasn't as robust, but um, pushed it out of the ring every time. Can anybody understand or imagine why the other robot might have done that? I'm sure they got underneath your front there. Mm, okay, not too bad of a guess, but it turns out that this piece of plastic is actually relatively heavy. And it was only after I spent two and a half hours throwing chunks of plastic into my safety glasses that I realized that I was putting a whole bunch of weight on the front wheel and relieving the weight from the traction wheels. So this thing would turn around and find the robot and start to move. And then his would eventually figure out and just push forward and knock me out of the ring. So 
Okay, so anyhow, that's my, I don't know what the story means, but it was kind of sad and funny all at once. You know, Carl, in the, in the big league uh, subsumption, they, they use vacuum cleaners to suck the, suck the robot down to the floor and keep it from being, make it hard to push. Yeah. That's all you need is vacuum cleaner. Vacuum cleaner. Yep. yep. I, I was going to suggest that the, 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 the front of the uh, robot having a, a slope on it pushes it down also on the front. There's a little bit of slope on your front end. Mm. I muted you, David. We're getting tons of reverb from your microphone. Me, David? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, my mic is turned off. My mic was turned off during the. Okay, well, anyhow, so there's there's a, a request for bee trees, which I barely remember from undergraduate days and haven't really seen since. But, but Rud, will you, will you accept David's challenge and share some thoughts on bee trees? Uh-oh. And you, you don't need to unmute. What's your... Remembering from undergrad, maybe um, what you're thinking of binary trees, not to be confused with what um, I have uh, been working with called behavior trees. Oh, behavior trees. Yeah, I was, I was thinking of the data structure. Right. <clears throat> and it's a little bit difficult to explain without a whole bunch of diagrams. So uh, I'll do what I can on here. To start with, of course, with any type of tree, you have a leaf node. And a leaf node is something in a behavior tree that takes an action. So if you, uh, that's your actual behavior uh, or your task that, that's going to execute. Uh, change values, cause the motors to move, cause uh, a hand to move, whatever. And so those are generally called actions. And you have trees above that, which you start with, a, uh, of course, a, a main node, a starting point. And then there's two sets of sequences of action that could happen. One is it starts out and it proceeds through the uh, that set of tasks which if any of them return true or active then it then the whole sequence then returns up to the top level and uh, uh, comes up one level the other set of sequence is basically all of the actions, all of the, the nodes must return true and before it returns. If any of them return false, then it returns false. Now you build these into a, a larger tree. So you have a sequence of perhaps at the stop, top three um, of the what I call or gate type sequences where any one of them can um, get a return is true and things are fine, um, whatever actions have been. And of course, you have this embedded in your general control loop of, you know, first off, getting the information from the environment, going through the be behavior trees, and then at the end of the, uh, when the top node returns, uh, somehow returns true uh, from the, the lower activities, um, then you perform your outputs, your general control loop, um, just like you, know, uh, you generally see with robots. So the, the point is, okay, so you, you build up this tree and at some point, uh, whatever action is going to need to be taken returns a true 
and that somehow filters all the way up to the top node, and that action has set the stage for whatever actual outputs are needed at that point, if any. Um, I have a very general feeling here that I'm totally losing everybody. <laughs> Uh, not at all. Uh, I, if I waited another week and came up with some diagrams. Yeah. Well, you could certainly do that. It, it, it would be helpful. Uh, I was intrigued by, uh, I, got, I know uh, behavior trees are a, a kind of a big deal in ROS. And uh, people who yeah. use that seem to use a, a, a visualization tool called Groot, uh, where you actually see the tree in a graphic form. And uh, I, uh, looking through those and kind of getting just an intuitive feel for how it works and your uh, observation that uh, subsumption then is really just a subset of, of a way to set up a behavior tree, uh, which, uh, which is intriguing. I see, I think I see uh, what it is you're driving at here. But yeah, we won't put you on the spot, but if you want to come back in a week with pictures, that would be <laughs> Yeah, basically the the or type gate that I or that I call it um, is subsumption. It's the addition of the different one, which is an AND gate where everything has to uh, come back with a, a true condition, an active condition that uh, makes a difference on there. And that's where you get your some some of the additional power in the behavior trees. Is uh, you want to walk through a door, you got to have three things. Uh, at least, um, you got is the door open? Uh, if not, then you branch into a tree that opens the door. Uh, once the door is open, you know if you're walking through it. You know, did you actually walk through it? And then finally, are you on the other side of that? And that all three of those conditions have to be true to say you've entered a room. And that's one of the the sequences that. Uh, can occur in a uh, in the behavior trees. So when you do something like that, I mean, do you have to set up? I can imagine that if you have a, a multiple, like a large set of conditions that have to be met, there might be some many dependencies. So, is it? How do you deal with the dependencies, uh, interdependencies? Uh, I mean, is that just how you build the graph? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's basically it. You start with, you know, what are the conditions that you have to have? That condition's true, then, you know, you proceed along the, the sequence to to uh, take advantage of the fact that that's true. If it's not true, then you get into a different sequence, which says, here's how you do it, um, and, and cause it to become true. So as I say, with walking through a door, first thing you do is the door open. Is the door locked? Uh, the I had a. Locked. You got to unlock it. Then you got to open it. Then you got to walk through it. Now you're in the other room. I had a question that I'm, I'm going to posit a, a proposal, effectively. That my understanding of a lot of the robot implementations that we've got now are effectively like a control loop that goes through this loop over and over again, 20 or 25 hertz. And the actual behaviors that are being triggered or, or optional in that loop effectively with any emergent behaviors are, establish what the behavior of that robot is. So let's say we've got a robot that has six behaviors and it's running at 20 hertz. And so out of that, you get a particular set of behaviors from the robot. And that's how I think a lot of the robots are, are running. In mine, I'm using a message bus and all that, but effectively it's kind of the same idea. So whatever the behaviors that I define and enable will create a set of behaviors in my robot. So what I'm wondering is rather than try to create it as a tree, we could theoretically keep that same single loop structure, but have a higher level that basically set different profiles in other words, if let's say there's an available dozen behaviors, but six of them are used to get through a door, or three of them are used for a moth or anti-moth behavior, we could basically create profiles of different sets of enabled and disabled behaviors from the entire pool of behaviors. And if we could have a higher level control over which profile got set, which group of um, behaviors were enabled or disabled, we would then get different sets of behaviors from the robot. 
You're actually. We only might, we only might need one level above that to create those pro or to trigger those profiles. Um, I competed in a, a NASA competition where I actually had to physically build a robot. Um, some of my later activities have been all in simulation. And my use at that time in 2013 was subsumption. One of the additions I made to it was the setting what I call goals. Hmm. And one of the, the trick was there was a uh, an activity, a task in the subsumption that would change what goal was active. Hmm. For instance, the first thing the robots had to do, and I had three of them, was drive off of a starting platform. And so the goal there was uh, pause for a certain amount of time, each of the robots having a different amount of time to deconflict them. <laughs> So they didn't run into one another and then just drive forward for, you know, a period of time. So one was, you know, 10 feet away from the starting goal. One was starting platform and so forth. Once they attained that position, then it switched to the goal of search, mm -hmm. which was go out and start looking for uh, samples that were scattered around the, the park area. And each of them, uh, uh, each of them actually turned in a different direction at the very end and then started the search from that position. So again, a further deconflict them. They had a search of park area that was 20,000 square meters. So it was a big, big area and two hours to complete yeah. the, the process. So that was, that was my first approach to doing kind of what you just said of setting, you know, a higher level, um, some organization that would determine more directly the specific goal that you were trying to achieve. Mm. You do the same thing with behavior trees because that would be what you have up on the, the very top level of the tree. Um, and in fact, one of the, one of the ways you can set up uh, a sequence is if a behavior has returned true, it's not in called again. So as I said, my, my first behavior um, in the sequence would be leave the platform. Once it's left the platform, it's kind of not removed from the tree, but effectively ignored from that point on because it's, it's true, it's done. And so there, uh, that's exactly how you, uh, you handle the, the highest level of switching between things. And you might get to some other point where you may, got, may have completed three goals and well, say I got a sample back to the starting platform and I'm on the starting platform. I dropped off the sample. Now I want to leave again. Well, then I'll go back and I mark that activity as false and start over again where it, it leaves the platform and, and, and starts the whole search process again for another sample. And this was a competition just incidentally, that was called the sample return robot. And the current Mars Perseverance is collecting samples and putting them in little cylinders and leaving them, you know, a trail of them beyond, uh, around Mars as it, along its path. The 2024 mission is meant to follow along and find those samples, sample return, collect them and bring some of them back to earth. And this competition that NASA had was uh, intended to generate ideas about doing that, that process. Hmm. Let, me, let me try if I can uh, uh, to understand what you're describing. Uh, in the contest that you uh, entered, uh, the subsumption machine you had basically had more than one list of subsumption behaviors. And when you describe goals, what Murray was describing as profiles, you're actually switching which list uh, that you're operating on. Is that correct? That's correct. Hmm. Okay. And that's and really the behavior trees allow you to do that, but without the sleight of hand, if you will. <clears throat> that, right. It fits more naturally in the whole uh, whole setup. Yeah, I, I part of me because we've had the mailing list discussion about this as well, and Rudy, it was really interesting because that's kind of where I'm at. I've been struggling in this Python-based robot OS I'm writing 
And I've had a couple different goes at this problem with complete ignorance of how it's been done before. And I was basically trying all sorts of different things. And, I, and this idea of what I was calling a profile, but I like goal better. Basically, a goal sets, enables and disables a bunch of different behaviors and maybe turns on one behavior that had never been on before. And that's the one that does something that enables this overall goal to be fulfilled. So I, I like that idea. And I, I wouldn't have to rewrite my whole OS to, in order to do that. It would basically be just one level up to kind of set the goals. Right. You may remember at one time, uh, Kareem uh, suggested that subsumption is actually a way of sort of formalizing state machine. And uh, by the same token, it sounds like uh, my understanding of behavior trees is a sort of way of formalizing if then else statements. Uh, because as you know, when you get when those get into the hundreds, it can get out of hand. And the be behavior trees are a way to try to get that back in. It, it, does, does, that, does that fit with what you're saying? Yeah, to a large extent. You know, as I've looked at artificial intelligence, I never worked in the field per se, but was always interested in it. And except for the current work with like neural networks, every approach has been a fancy way of doing if then else statements. <laughs> you know? It has been, you know, and, that, and that's, you know, if you go back to, um, well, you know, you, it just has. <laughs> um, I think the, as with subsumption um, and behavior trees, considering them an extension of them, one of the advantages of them is it's fairly easy to introduce new um, goals, if you will, uh, new actions in there without disrupting the entire tree. If you've got a section of the tree working, you can add something on another branch of the tree and that original one still works. Whereas now your new one may do something different and you got to debug it so it doesn't cause conflicts with other things that already work. But it allows the introduction of new things without the disruption that some of the previous uh, attempts at camouflaging if then else were fragile um, because once you added something new, it often broke the things that already worked. Um, th these are a little bit more flexible. And I'll, I'll, I'll point out as I did in the, the emails, it's not only using the uh, behavior trees are not only in robotics, but in game playing. Mm -hmm. The your uh, artificial intelligence in games uh, that you're competing against is often by behavior trees. They've driven a lot of this discussion uh, in, in, in working with behavior trees uh, on how to use them, how to work with them, and so forth. There's a bunch of articles, and many of them uh, come out of the gaming uh, folks to uh, determine, uh, define the behavior trees and, and make them, uh, explain them, show how to make them work. So if you're, the, you're looking for more information, you know, look in the area of, ga of gaming also. A suggestion, um, this, this seems to be a large area and given the level of interest in, uh, in subsumption, um, an area that I think, and in Ross, I think an area that um, would benefit from a sort of more comprehensive overview, such as like a monthly talk on here's here are the basic concepts of this thing. Um, I've I've tried on a couple of occasions reading the Wikipedia article uh, page and and uh, trying the Ross page and other avenues to understand what these behavior trees are, and as Murray alluded. There are some concepts that never seem to get explained. Like, do they get cold at 20 hertz, like a subsumption stack does, or do they sit down in a task until it completes? And then the intermediate layers and the types of layers you can have, and the way that they return, and how these falses and trues that can come from lower levels ripple up. I think is. I just want to suggest that that would be in. A rich opportunity for a uh, a monthly talk on here are the concepts 
and how you use them. Not to put you on the spot here, Rude, but <laughs> yeah, I would let's certainly don't, welcome that. <laughs> let's don't scare him off. Ah, next thing you know, you're going to ask him to run for president next year. I mean, come <laughs> on, guys. <laughs> I was thinking about I'm not Della. Uh, I want to. Incidentally, my name is. I may be rude, but my name is Rudd. 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 Okay. I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> we'll we'll correct Rudd, that. Is it, is it short for something like Rudyard? Yeah, Rudyard Kipling. My grandmother was a big fan of his. Gave it to my father, and I got it from him. Nice man who would be king. I think we have. Uh, I missed. Uh, someone had raised a hand. Um, uh, I had one one comment I wanted to make. Can you hear me? Yes. The people were talking about gaming theory in the context of subsumption, if then behavior tree. And when we look at the, the gaming technology as it is evolving, one of the things which has really come up with is what is called reinforcement learning. Like you do a chess, you move a, a coin from one place to another. And then when you do that, you get a reward or a punishment. And based on the behavior you do, move a, a, a pawn, move a, a knight, whatever you do at that particular position based on the state, you don't, you're not really worried about the state, but you take an action and then you get a reward or a punishment. Based on the reward or the punishment and having done these time and time and time again and figuring out which are the moves which give you the rewards, the reinforcement learning enables the automatic game with artificial intelligence to do those behaviors or those steps where it gets more rewards. Now, once it finds this out, it really is not an if then. It really is a complex state with a lot of multiplication and mathematics, which enables you to determine. So even though we have behavior tree based on if then, and, and, and say that that is applicable to gaming theory, the point I'm trying to make is gaming theory has got other techniques such as reinforcement learning. And I'm wondering that in the robotics world also, reinforcement learning may have its own place. I don't know whether anybody has studied that, but I just realized it's a different way of approaching to define the next step for a robot to take. That sounds like uh, another good presentation. I, I have a little answer for that um, based on my background in, in KR, and that is um, that in order to be able to judge whether a particular result from a behavior is, let's say, a reward or a punishment, you have to be able to establish the context, complete context in which that action occurred. And if you don't have a full context, you don't, you don't know whether the bear is standing next to you or whether it's a mountain or if you don't have the context, you are very likely to make a wrong judgment about what actually happened. And so part of the thing about building models, world models, is you actually have to be able to contain within the world model all the potential contexts that you want to use to judge behaviors. And if you can't capture context, in other words, you can't get the state, the relevant state of all the objects around you to know which one are, are which ones are relevant and which ones are not. You can't establish the context, and therefore you don't know what to save as what is the context of that particular action. And if you can't do that, then you can't judge whether the action it might have just might have been just happened to be raining that day kind of so, thing. You don't know. So um, what you're saying is it is difficult to know whether when an action is taken, if you don't have all the context, whether I should reward it or punish it. Uh, it might but, be coincidence. Could could be, but if you really look at the way reinforcement is learning is done, for for example, playing chess, the amount of time required in order to give a reward or a punishment goes into millions of simulations, and subsequent to those millions of simulations, it finds a way. So it's a different technique rather than very basic behaviors, but just something to consider. No, and, and actually in game theory, like in chess or in Go, the context is always available. You can see all of the moves up to that point. So in those types of simulations, it's almost trivial to figure out what the context is. But when you step outside of that into even the world of shaky, like the robot, you know, with a very controlled environment, but into a more uncontrolled environment, like an outdoor or an uncontrolled indoor environment, 
you don't know whether the cat is there or whether the door is open or whether the lights are on. And if you can't capture those things and also know which ones of those are actually relevant, you can't capture context. So in simple, ga simple games like chess and go, it's not too hard to do. But as soon as you actually have a physical embodied robot, that's very difficult. Thank you. I, I, I love that you just called it simple games like chess and go. Well, that's my point, though, is that they have mathematical solutions. That, they you know, do not have mathematical <laughs> solutions. That's the whole well, point. That's what makes okay, them, you that's what like makes them difficult. Open, don't you? Like, <laughs> well, you mean, can actually, that you one, can that actually figure deserved. out all the particular moves in a chess game, but you can't tell me well, what a can, robot has done up to the can, last you, moment. You can figure out the history. You can't project. The, this, it's still non-trivial to decide whether or not it was a good move or not. Uh, Are you and about you chess? Can, uh, chess and Go. Yeah, yeah. Go is yeah. even more complicated in terms of the number of uh, combinations, yeah. of possible moves uh, in the in the future. Uh, it's it's not a it's it's a it's a very deep problem. I understand uh, and, that my point yeah. was a bit different though, and that is is that those are entirely abstract con constructs they're not in the real world they're not in the physical world no i agree simulation is a different different beast mm -hmm. i think constrained might be the operative word here that those are constrained environments mm. so they're mathematically approachable right and there has been lots of approaches to them mathematically you know whereas a physical robot operating in a house or a laboratory or outdoors is an entirely different situation. I would agree. Even for us, I was sure that sock wasn't there yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. What, a, what an interesting uh, set of discussions. So now, now uh, I have another thing to look at aside from subsumption. We can look at behavior trees and um, see what we can learn about those. And and no one will bring up PID controllers ever again. Yeah, it'll it'll happen. Just just don't go there tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody wants to. Um, David, you mentioned a, a program that was part of Ross. I, I think it was a behavior tree display called Root Groot or Root. Well, it's Groot, G R O O T. O O T. I have a, I have question, a question about, about pig controllers. <laughs> okay, well, I wanted to, sh uh, I wanted to show a little something. It's not. Well, well, let's let's ahead. move on then. So actually, Doug. So we had uh, we had David Anderson in queue, and then you. Oh, okay, and okay. Then Now we'll All have right. Ted with pig controllers. Well, I don't have anything about robotics. So, uh, Doug, if you want to go first, I I just have a general query for the group, or I can go. Okay, I will go. Uh, there's a uh, professor at SMU uh, named Christopher Dolder. Uh, he's head of the dance department. He's very talented and brilliant man. And uh, his field is kinesthesiology, which is the physics of movement. And so what they're doing is they're setting up a lab where you have uh, you know, uh, depth sense cameras and infrared cameras and motion capture and all this sort of thing where they can study dance movement. And this, this is actually kind of common. There are a lot of these. And, but what he wants to do, because he's a kinesthesiologist, is he wants to be able to measure uh, the force of the dancers uh, into the floor. And uh, in particular, uh, the example he gave me was that a ballerina uh, up on point uh, on one leg, so 120 pound a ballerina up on point on one leg has the entire weight of her body on the size of a, about a quarter. And that when she leaps into the air off that one leg, the amount of force uh, into the floor is, he said, it's like a baseball bat hitting a fastball. Uh, so what he wants to do is he wants to measure and quantify all these sorts of things. And he wants a floor that can do that for him. So I suggested, well, why don't you just put the sensor on the dancer's feet? And he said, uh, because it might not be their feet, it might be hands or elbows or hips or heads or shoulders or knees. Uh, so, so here's the problem. He wants a 10 foot by 10 foot uh, dance floor uh, that can return uh, where uh, the pressure is on that floor 
and there might be more than one spot, like if you're on hands and knees, and how much pressure there is on each spot. Uh, and uh, I went and looked up, I thought, okay, 10 square feet. So if, I don't know what resolution he wants, but imagine that it's one square inch. So we have one square inch presser sensors, and that'll take 144 of them per square foot, which means 14,400 pressure sensors with a piece of marley on top of them or something like that. Well, that boggles my mind. So uh, at that point, I kind of ran out of ideas. And that's why I would, we don't necessarily have to come up with something this evening, but I know there's a brilliant group of engineers here gathered. And uh, if anybody can think of a way uh, uh, how to think about this problem, uh, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Doug? So you, you, okay, if you're gonna measure the, um the floor and I got him at one inch you maybe you know, if you could talk him into like three inch by three inch you might you, you know you cut everything down a bit but um, those um, sensors that they use in scales are very inexpensive I can't remember what they call them uh, strain gauge strange gauge yeah there's they are based on strain gauge but that's not what they they call them a, a something like a weight cell or a, a load cell load cell yeah. load cell okay so you know those are pretty reasonably uh priced and they have you essentially per load cell you have to have a, a real high uh, high count uh 80 uh analog to digital converter Okay, so those are, you know, that would be one option if you wanted to direct measurement. The other thing that would be interesting is if you could get underneath the floor and the floor was a membrane type thing, you might be able to uh, say, picture it, picture it as a, a, a floor that's reinforced at foot level. All right, so you got a foot by foot. So there's a membrane that's a foot by foot in the middle, and you have something underneath that's literally looking at the de the deflection of the floor. I mean that that you know you'd have to know what the floor material was, and there's probably some other things you need to know, but that might be another approach. I'm just I'm just uh, talking off my head here. So, but uh, you know if I were trying. If I were trying it, I'd probably try the load cells first. Because, like I said, how much does he want to spend on this? That's the other question. Well, you know, it, you really have to, in the research establishment, you have to turn that question on its head. You find out how much it costs, and then you write a grant proposal for that money and see if you can get somebody to fund it. Yeah, I would, I would really, you know, like I say, two, two, two possible. Uh, things one would be the deflection method okay and you know if it's i would that might be limited by the top force they could actually put on it you know what i'm saying i mean you wouldn't want somebody going up on toe and then all of a sudden cracking through the floor uh, uh but uh i i'm sure that there's multiple ways to do that if if you pose that question to the web uh you know, just they can. He also mentioned. He huh? also mentioned that it has to be able to rebound quickly because there may be real quick multiple pressures, pressure points. Did you say ten square feet? Ten feet square. Ten, ten feet by ten feet. So a hundred square feet times one hundred and forty-four. So fourteen thousand four hundred sensors. And wires running to them and microprocessors to read them. So it, isn't there some kind of fabric or something like that? I noticed uh, uh, Rudd had his hand up. Uh, uh, we should let him get his. Yeah, yeah Rudd, I had to yeah, unmute you. So just unmute and jump in anytime. But just know that your audio has some coupling issues. A couple of our members have that. I noticed that when I was testing before the, I joined in. I haven't had that problem with Zoom or other systems, so I'm not sure what's going on. Mm -hmm. First question, um, or first, first thought is how do touch pads work? 
um, particularly the ones that you know can sense double double finger stroking and uh, same thing with touch screens. Uh, what's the mechanism there behind those? Because it sounds like basically what the same type of problem. My second thought was if you laid down a grid of one in wires, one inch part, so that you had a grid. Yeah, got that, David. And there were strain sensors on each of those wires around the perimeter. It's kind of like multiplexing LEDs on a grid, and but in reverse. You could sense the pressure on the XY, the crossover of a point from the outside edges. And then, you know, even if you've got multiple ones, uh, you know, you've got two here and and it's being, let me go, I think it's in the right place here. here. There we go. And it's being touched in two places. You can tell because you're getting tension from this one and the horizontal one. So it eliminates a ton of sensing. So that would actually just be uh, basically the 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 grid of wires is a is like a passive sensor. There's not actually sensors on the floor, but sensors around the edge connected to the wires. That's correct. And then and, uh, you have to see old... all those tensions. I think yeah. like the Palm Pilot era uh, PDAs used. Uh, um, Resistive uh, pressure sensitive display that worked in just that fashion. Um, exactly. But that can give you location, Coral, but I don't think it can give you pressure. I, I might be wrong, but I, in fact, I actually have one sitting here in a closet where it's just a, it's just a glass plate and it has, it's what you would put on top of an iPad pad, tablet to give you touch control. You can but get some, it's just a, a grid, a resistive yeah, I think, grid. I think you can find like there are, uh, there are those, like SparkFun has those flexible strain gauges um, that can measure bend and deformation. So I think with some combination of that, maybe in a matrix and with some known, um, uh, what's, what's the right mechanical term? Uh, yeah, there, you can get a, the, where you have the resistance between the wires uh, as a function of the pressure. And so I think something of that ilk might work. So you, so you could have something like, uh, David, like a, a woven um, fabric or something like that, uh, where you're actually able to measure the deformation between the wires, is that it? Yeah, yes. That, that is, it's, it's an effect, a pressure sensitive and I've seen that for uh, screens uh, where the, uh, it actually will measure uh, how much pressure there is at the one point. So you get not only the X and Y, but also the pressure. That's, that's exactly what he wants. Uh, David, now, small David. Whether, it has, whether it has the range that you're looking for or not, I don't know, but I'm just saying that uh, as, as you crash down on the two wires, that the amount of pressure changes the resistance. And that since it's an X and Y thing, you know also the location. Now, uh, the issue with that would be as to whether you have uh, multiple points or not, and whether you, whether you can determine the difference between the different points. Hey, David, if you, if you actually um, Google film that changes color with pressure, there's uh, uh, several links on color changing pressure sensitive materials. That might be useful. So, Films that change color with pressure is the search term. And, and I was having luck with the search term woven pressure sensor fabric. So it's 
so many options. Yeah. That way you might be able to do it with just some cameras. Cool. Well, great. Uh, that's all. That's my question, guys. I appreciate all possible input. And if you suddenly sit up in bed in the middle of the night this week and say, aha, all he needs is. <laughs> is this. Two pieces of wire in a diode. <laughs> Some duct tape. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, David. Uh, next in queue, we had uh, Doug P. Okay. And then we had uh, behind him, Ted uh Myers, who wanted to bring up bid loops, either seriously or as a joke, and then whoever <laughs> else wants to go after Ted is, is unknown. It's wide open. So, Mr. Doug Paradis, what, what have you got tonight? Okay, very little, but I, I want to go ahead and, and share it here. Uh, okay, let me see here. Again, I need to do... It, it can't be much less than what I presented, so... Uh, let me think in here and do this okay now i'm pinned on here okay can you guys see this this is yes. a this is a breakout board that's from df robot for the pico and i'm going so i'm this is one in my physical hand so you can see that it's you can get them now let's see this is the part right here and four dollars and ninety cents a piece, so they actually cost more than the Pico. But uh, let's look at it. Uh, let's see here. So, okay. So you can see they have all of the digital I/O broken out. They have the three analog pins broken out. They have two. I squared C's where multiple, there's two things I could think could be used here. You could either hook four I squared C's to the single bus, or you could use two of these positions to put, uh, uh, well, actually, you could use some other positions to do that too, but you could actually use this to uh, uh, provide your, uh, your pull up resistors. So if you wanted to control your pull up resistors from this board, you could, you, with a little creativity, it, it would be real easy to do by just plugging them in between the uh, necessary uh, buses. It has, um, so both the I squared C's are pulled out. It has two UARTs pulled out, and then it has some SPI, spy two SPI buses, and then it has a, a general display interface for the tapes that are real common with some of the some of the different uh, uh, different uh, displays that they have available now. And this is the power over here. So anyway, uh, I thought that I'm looking at this as a way to use the Pico boards easily. And I wanted to share that with you guys. Um, and that's pretty much all I had to say. Uh, thank you. I think uh, Murray, you had a your hand raised. Uh, was there something about Doug's thing for that, or I think we've lost Murray. Murray raised his hand, and then he. Left. I think he was going to leave early. Maybe he has left early. But uh, I will tell you. I will tell you. I just got some Pimeroni stuff, so I'll pick up the Murray slack there because I know he's a Pimeroni. I will tell you. I got some Pimeroni stuff that has one of those. Uh, uh, you take a Pico board, throw it on there, and you got some of their uh, th uh, four more packs that you just slap onto the things. Really easy, really convenient to use, and I had a good time with them. Well, me and Doug uh, I saw had some synergy going on there, but we <laughs> were, so there you go. It's cool. I saw Ray was nodding his head there. Ray, have you used those devices? You're muted. You're muted. We're having an audio issue night, aren't we? Anyway, I've just seen them. Um, yeah, I thought they were, you know, very unique as far as like a prototyping board. There's other similar things out there like that where um, 
ESP32 for um, um, the OpenMB H7. Uh, you know, there's, there's all kinds of different boards you can plug onto it. And I, I actually wanted to show something. So, well, it's not identical to that, but it's kind of like um, an all-in-one package that is, yeah, I don't know. I, is, Harold, were you done? Should I just go? I think Ted was in queue next, but. Oh, oops, Ted. All right. Away. Well, I will go. I was, well, Murray kept bringing up PID loops and I was half kidding, but I do have a question. So, um, you know, I understand there's there's a set point and then there's your like current value and then that produces an output. Well, my question is, what do I hook up the output of the PID loop to? So um, to kind of expand on this, I, uh, as I'm driving my car, I'm thinking about this. And I'm thinking when I, like if I'm not going fast enough, then I want to press down on the accelerator uh, a little bit more or, uh, you know, a little bit less. So I'm not actually changing like there in my mind, I'm not changing the absolute position of the accelerator, but the like the relative position a little bit more, a little bit less. And I've always thought of the output as being where to set the accelerator, you know, like zero to a hundred. No, the output is what goes to the plant. In your case, it's the motor. The input is the encoder chips that come back in. The throttle or what you're talking about the accelerator is reference. Okay, but you can't just send a number to the motor. Ted, I, th I think you skipped a couple of steps there. You talked about you talked about an input, and you talked about uh, a set point, um, and uh, and then you went straight to output without going through um, calculating the error value and right. And uh, you know, I can look up the derivatives right. and all that kind of stuff. I can look up the al the formulas and the algorithm for calculating those. But mine's more of a philosophical question. What the output number, what do I hook it up to? It doesn't mean anything. No, no. it's still, think of it. The output will be what it needs to do to drive the motor to give you the input that's going to match what your reference is. Right. So you're going to have to limit it. You know, you're going to have to define the upper and lower bounds of your of your output. But given an input and given a, the inputs of feedback, if you want to think of it, and the reference is the signal, okay? Uh, so let's, let's take a look at one that you were trying to just, uh, we're going to look at uh, heading error. Okay. Okay, heading error, uh, it, you know, you would, Normally, if you wanted to go in a straight line, your reference would be zero because you want your heading error to be zero, right? Okay. Okay. Now, your heading error is either going to be in radians or in degrees or degrees per second. Okay. You follow me? So, you have a heading error, all right? So... You want to go this way, but you're really going this way. This distance in between is your heading error. So that's that'd be your degrees, that, not degrees. That's your okay. Well, that's your input. Okay. Really yeah, that's right. degrees. That's degrees. But you got to remember, you're also doing this time slices. But it's easier to think of it as in degrees. All right. Then, uh, or you can think of it in angular velocity. Okay. Now, so anyway, there's so it's degrees. So you want to drive those degrees to zero. Well, the PID loop is going to calculate the error. You, here you have a big error. So it's going to send a big signal, corrective signal. And, and if you use David's terminology, it'd be the rotational portion of your, your motor response. And then it's just going to, uh, I like to actually have the ro rotation up in, in my reference. But So it's going to turn a big motor response to bring it back to zero, okay? 
Am I being clear here? I, I see a puzzled look, so I guess I'm not. I don't. Uh, well, I mean, but well, let's do speed. That the the let's motor do response speed. doesn't tell you where to put your steering wheel. No, that's your reference. You have to tell it where you want to go. Yeah, so but that's in in Ted's language, though, Doug. I think uh, what you're saying is reference. I think is set point because. Oh yeah. Okay. okay. But yeah, Ted's saying right. you want to you want to have it turn at a certain angle or something. So, see you, Kumar. You, you, the set point is where you want to turn it to, and then there's some feedback that says where it actually is turning at the moment. That's the input. Okay. Whatever you. And Ted wants to call it current value. So, and then yeah. then you you mix those together and develop the error and put it through the the math the and, and out comes the output. But I think philosophically, to my, to me, Ted, you were asking about the output. So, to me, that depends then on actually what are you connecting the output to, because um, you might, like in the heading or st steering, you know, you you might connect the output to some um, uh, whatever that that uh, pinion steering is in a car. So yeah. that might be one kind of output, or you might connect it to. Uh, differential signal to different differential wheels in a robot that'd be a different kind of output but fundamentally you're still measuring a set point compared to a current value so right. I think that's that's so and that's the steering wheel and so your is your output your output is going to drive a motor that turns the steering wheel but the motor uh, is controlled by a voltage, so your your output is a voltage that goes to the motor. It'll be a number. It'll be a case, number. If it's normal, it'll be probably be somewhere between minus two fifty five and two fifty five. But, yeah, but see, that's not going to work. PW. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, let's back up a minute. Uh, when we talk about pig controllers, there's actually used in this group, there's two different flavors. One flavor is a pig controller that controls position. The other flavor is a pig controller that controls velocity. So when you're talking about steering, that's a, that's a position control. When you're talking about speed, that's a velocity control. So let's narrow it down to just velocity for this. For this okay, group. that makes it easier. Yeah, I, actually, I, I goofed that up. I should have probably just went with velocity. So. Okay. Okay, yeah, so, it, you have a, so you so have a set point. Five. You have a robot. Five, yeah. No, I get to do it. Go ahead. <laughs> so you have a set point. Uh, I'm sorry, you have a robot. And uh, let's say to make things simple, uh, that its speed is controlled by a, a value between zero and 100, or zero and one, or whatever you want, where zero is stopped and 100 is full speed. Okay, now you want the robot to go. 50 but it's currently going zero so your set point is 50 and your current reading your current sensing is zero and so that's your input that's the your input input is zero so the error in this case is the difference between what you want and what you have so what you have is zero and what you want is 50 so the difference between them is 50. so since this is a pid controller uh <clears throat> the proportional error is scaled by something. So let's say it's scaled by 0.1. Uh, or Make it one or two. <laughs> Make it two. So, so it's going to be a different value than the actual error. And you're going to then, in the PID controller, you're then going to accumulate that. So the question becomes, when we've actually reached 50, that value is going to, each time around the loop, that value is going to build up until We've actually got a velocity of 50. So we want a velocity of 50, and we've got a velocity of 50. So the error is zero. But you don't want to send a zero to your motor. You want the motor, you're trying to tell the motor, whatever speed you're going now, stay at that speed. So the zero represents basically the offset that you're going to add to that every time around the loop. Once you reach the proper speed, the, the error goes to zero. So in this case, you can think of uh, think of a simple controller that's just a PD controller. So it's got a proportional and a derivative term. And the output of that is accumulated. The output of that is integrated. It's that integrated output that drives the motor. 
you just said integrated. So now you got a confusion because it you're really saying repeat a PI controller. Well, in that, except in this case, the P and the D are basically driving an output, which is an I. So it's really a PD controller. Six of one, half a dozen the other. Okay. Yeah. The, so this, what, you're, this, what you're saying is you're controlling, you're really controlling the change of the, like, let's say the motor, it's electric motor, so it's running on a voltage. So you're, you're increasing the voltage until you get to the right speed and then you stop increasing. That's right. And it, because yeah, it's yeah. a PID controller, the error gets smaller and smaller as you get closer and closer to the set point. Right, so okay. So that's, that's what differentiates it from a linear controller where the amount of error remains the same each time around the loop. Okay, so the output is not the voltage you're sending to the motor, it's the change in voltage. No, it's the output you're sending to the motor. It's but, you. so, well, so I'm saying, let's, sure. let's just go back to proportional. If, if, okay. you're, if your okay. error is zero, That's a good one. Then you don't change the output of the motor. If the error is positive, then you, then you decrease the output of the motor. No, you, and if it's negative, you increase it. Yeah, so let's, let's run it through. Your, your, your stop, you want to go 50. All right. You've got a P, KP of two. All right. So, All right. so the first time through the loop, your error is 100. 50 times two. No, that's not the error. That's the yeah. That's the error because your difference, the error, the error. The difference you're stopped, and you want to go fifty, so the, the error, error is fifty. But it goes through and it goes to it's multiplied by your KP of two, so a hundred gets sent to your motor. Okay. Okay. Now, now the motor's moving something. Let's say it's going twenty-five. All right. So. Now you come back up and your output 25. You want to go 50. So the difference is the error is 25. Okay, it's, it's, you know, I could have said 30 or 30 and the error would be 20. Okay, and that times two will be 40 and that'll go to the motor the next time. But, no, that doesn't go to the motor. Well, you add 40 to your 100, and now you have 140 going to the motor. Is that correct, David? It's the phrase going to the motor is what's throwing us off here. <clears throat> so picture the PID controller running out in outer space, disconnected uh, from anything. Uh, I'm going to use my hand. So my hand here is the output of the controller, which in the case I described is actually the I term. So if the error is zero, it just stays here. But if the error is positive, it pushes it. Positive error means we're going too slow. So the motor needs to be speeded up. So we're going to push the accelerator to a higher level. If we shoot past the level we want, then we need to slow back down. So we'll get a negative error and we pull the accelerator back down. But if we're going at exactly the speed we want, then the difference between what the motor says and what we ask is zero. So whatever position we have found is the position we want to remain at. And we will, because each time around the loop, we're only adding zero to that value and it won't change. Now, how that value actually scales to a voltage value is, is, is independent. It doesn't matter. So yeah, if right, your voltage right. goes, or you have a controller uh, like the RoboClaw, wants minus one to plus one floating point. Uh, these little uh, H bridges that I use uh, want zero to 255, where zero is full negative and 128 is stopped and 255 is full forward. So that has to be scaled from the output of your PID controller. And the PID controller, you know, often if you look up the examples, the PID controllers are all uh, scaled to one anyway. Uh, just because it makes all the rest of the math easier. But whatever that value is, when you reach the velocity you want, you continue to send that same value uh, to the motors. And then uh, 
the set point can remain the same, but the measured value can change. For example, you hit a steep slope, so you begin to go uphill. That causes the robot to slow down. So even though our set point hasn't changed, the robot's velocity has, and we need to give it more voltage in order to maintain uh, the speed that we want. Ted, does any of this help? Yes, yes. Uh, I have figured it out now, and I will restate it, and you will probably say that I don't understand it at all, but to me it makes sense. So the output, if the output is zero, whatever the output of the pig controller is zero, whatever I happen to be sending to the motor at that time, I send that same number. So if that number is 128, I send a 128. If the output is positive, like let's say it's, let me stick my let me stick my nose in here. I think okay. you, you're you want to use the word error rather than output. If the error is zero, you continue to send the same value to the motor. If the error is positive, you increase the value. If the error is negative, you could increase the value. But if the the error is zero, you stay where you stay where you are. You're you're at the right velocity. All right. Well, so I think you're mixing two terms. The error is the difference between the set point and the current measured value, correct? Yes, and, yes. If, that, and if that error is zero, there is no difference between the set point and the current measured value, meaning the value you are currently sending to the motors is correct. But the output the of the pig controller, controller is not is equal not to the error. error. Correct. Right. So anyways, if, if I get I an get output, output of the big controller and that output happens to be on a scale of zero to one and that output is like 0.5, that means I'm going to slow. And so I'm going to increase my signal to the motor controller so that the motor controller goes faster. If the output is um, negative, then I need to decrease my signal to the motor controller. Uh, I think you're here, I think you're, you're confusing the word output with input. With error. Yeah. Well, it's the input to the, the output of the pig controller, uh, of, it's translated into the input to my motor controller. So the output goes to the input. But uh, if an error is zero, and the PID loop is working right, then whatever the current value is going into your motor controller, it's the right value and it'll hold it. Right. But if the error so is up or down. Not, if my error is zero, I should not turn off my motor controller. You hold wherever it is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah continue, continue sending. That's why uh, I was using for the gain constant a number less than one. Uh, Doug chose a number greater than one. Yeah. Uh, but I thought it'd be easier to, under, to do the math. But basically, if you think about it, just a P controller, ignore all the rest of that. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. Then when that constant is small, that means the number that you're accumulating is small. And so it takes a long time to get to the set point. If that number, if that gain number is large, that means the values that you're adding, that you're accumulating are large. And so you get more quickly to the set point. <coughs> However, <coughs> excuse me, token on my own words. However, when the value is large, the problem with the proportional controller is that you'll overshoot the set point and you'll continue to oscillate around it. That's the problem with the pure P controller. So you add the derivative term, and the derivative term allows you to basically have a large value. Uh, let me rephrase that. The derivative term allows the whole PID controller to move rapidly toward the set point, but still accurately find the set point when it gets there. And I have a little different look at it. I, you know, David likes PE, uh, PD controllers, and I like PI controllers. Uh, if you want to be absolutely on the value, if you want zero error, the only way you can achieve that is with an integration term. If you do it with just one of the problems with uh, proportional is that as it approaches 
the value that you want, your reference value, uh, what will happen is the proportional actually runs out of steam and it'll, it'll steady state at some value below your desired portion. And you can crank it up and it'll get closer, but then it does the ringing that, that, that David told you about. So, but if you keep it where it's completely uh, critically, you know, where there's never going to be any ringing, you'll see that it comes out and there'll be a gap between where you want to be and, and where it is. The only way you can close that gap is with an integration term. I don't, I don't disagree forward. with that. I would, go ahead. I was just saying you can also address it with a feed forward, uh, but th there's there's cases to be made for, uh, you know, a PIDF or whatever, you know, that it, it all depends on things like the amount of resistance you've got and massive, you know, it's, there's, there's, it's the actual dynamics that you got to adjust. And that's the whole tuning process. But that tuning process, regardless of which stages or components you choose to activate, um, once you get a tuned output, that is directly what you're sending to your motor controller, right? So that, that's, that's it. It is the output of the PID controller that is always driving your motor, that, that you're actually sending that number uh, if it's properly scaled. But the tuning process is what makes it scaled correctly for your, your actual hardware motor controller. Does that make sense? So, so let me throw this out there. I found a PID library um, in Arduino, and I hooked it up to my uh, wheel sensor and to the motor. And, you know, I put in the K, I think I just did derivative with with the um, derivative you can't, value. Can't do no, no, you don't derivative. catch the derivative. You, have to, and, you can do just proportional. What happened was, when when the motor was stopped, it it ramped the motor up to maximum, and then it shot way past the set point, and then it set to negative and shot way down, and it bounced. So then I turned down the K value way down, and uh, it you know it gradually worked its way up, and then it you know, as soon as it got to the set point, it would set the motor, the output would go to zero because the error was zero and it would turn off the motor. And then it would repeat. So it was bouncing up and down. It would do this jerk, 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 jerk because I was setting the output directly to the motor and apparently you can't do that. You have to- No, no, your problem was you had the gain too high and no derivative. Well, no, I mean, I, I did, I set the gain high, I set the gain low. Um, when I set the gain low, it just took longer to cycle back and forth. Okay, the, the, are you using uh, the, uh, the one, this, what do they call it? Pin but what I'm saying one? is you can't set, you can't take the output and send the output directly to the motor. You have to add the output, you have to, the output tells you how much to change what's going to the motor. It doesn't tell you what to send to the motor. Well, Ted, that's correct if you then take the output and integrate it. Right, you so you have to integrate the output. And yes, yeah, that's well, since saying. you're integrating the output, that becomes the I of the PID. Well, that's for a speed else. controller specifically. Yeah. For a speed controller, yes. Yeah. If you're just doing position control, you don't need you don't need that step. No. Okay. Yeah. So what I was doing was a speed controller, and you you have to. And I uh, swear I heard you say that you were starting out with derivative, and that that's not right. You got to start out with proportional. Yeah. Um. Oh, yeah, I might have misspoken. I was yeah, I was doing proportional, not derivative. Yeah. Now, one thing on that, you have to, a couple of other things that you have to set on that model, on that particular library that I think you're using, which uh, is you want to make sure that uh, you have uh, a loop, uh, a PID loop time that goes into it. And that, what, what happens is that has no interrupts in it. So it cycles through your loop. And whenever that 
that uh, loop time is achieved, then the PID fires off one time. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so you want to make sure that you're setting those things correctly. Because uh, you could get in, you could, if it's not set right, it, it'd be a problem. Uh, but, you know, I, if you want, I can, uh, if you want to talk about that particular library, because I've worked with it. In fact, I use it right now. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think I understand how that library works. I was just, my misunderstanding was what to do with the output. And I was trying to send it directly to the motor without integrating it. No. Let's see if I can. So, yeah, I think I got my questions answered. Thank you, guys. Well, I'm, I'm sure we confused you more. Oops. That's good. Uh, you always you good don't revisit. want to integrate the output. The output is directly to the, the motor. It's You need to set up the terms of the PID loop properly so that you have the right gain and crank up the derivative term to keep it from oscillating. Well, so Dave, let me ask you this. If the motor... If I've got the motor set so it's running at the speed that I'm getting the velocity I want, and then the error is zero, the output is the, is then zero, and so I don't want to turn the motor off. The output is not zero. The error is zero, but you're accumulating the output. You're integrating the output. Right. So right. that so the zero from the error is not changing the integrated, the accumulated output. But it is not zero. The error is not, I'm sorry, the output is not zero. The yeah, error is. is zero. So I agree with that. But you have to integrate it, because but, otherwise and, the output would be zero. And, and it is true, as Doug was, was observing, that most PID controllers in the world are PI controllers. Uh, the D element is added by those of us who are picky about how we want the response curve to look. But most controllers in the world are PI controllers. Um, okay. Uh, Ted, I'm going to show something here that might help. All right. So here is kind of some code from one of, one of mine. So here you can see I have two, two, two PIDs, one for the left motor and one for the right motor. Here you can see I'm setting the reference, okay? Now, okay. I think uh, the, this is where I do the rotation, but I believe that David and those guys do it later, on, and I'll show you. So here's the input. It's the encoder edges per for to velocity. Otherwise, I take the encoder edges and turn it into a velocity. All right. Now, if it if the timing is correct, you know, it's ready to, to run, then it'll trigger. And I said some stuff. Don't worry about that. But this is where the actual PID is computed. Okay. And then I just set the motors to the output of the left and right motor. And that's it. That's the whole thing. So you're not integrating it. No, well, then no, not mine. On mine, I'm using. Well, okay, here's where we go. Let's go here. Okay, you can see I have set point. I actually have three because I do one for the heading error. But so here you can see I have KP set and I have KI set. But I don't have. In my case, I didn't need it for this particular robot. I don't have any KD. I have used KD. If you're doing line followers, you might have a KP KD uh, controller and not have it KI because you don't really care if it's going exactly the speed that you're you wanting to go. So I don't know if that helps any. Ted, this this library has the integration in inside of the PID controller itself, so you don't need you don't need to integrate the output of the PID controller because when Doug set the KI term. The PID controller itself does the integration function. Yeah. And I put the link, I think it's the same library, Doug, if that's the same one you used in a club robot, that's the same library I'm using. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I, that's I a, put links to a, a pretty recent version of that library in the chat, along with, uh, I called the ultra detailed explanation of why the library is the way it is. And I found that as a really helpful way to walk through, because he, he kind of builds it up from first principles in the way that everyone's been talking about, start with P and then you add these extra embellishments. Well, and, I will look at that. The library I was using, if you set, if you just use the proportional gains, it would, if the error is zero, then the output is zero. That's not, that well, doesn't sound. That's correct. That's correct. That's proportional by definition, because it's. Yeah, yeah, but that's not integrating the output then. No, that's exactly right. So it was doing what it should right. have been doing. But so if you gave it an I, I gain. So I would have to integrate the output. Or if the if the PID library that you had would allow you to set the KI term, then you would give the KI term a number bigger than zero. And then that, that library would do the integration for you. Okay, so I think we're talking about two different integrations here. There's the integration in the I term and there's the integration of the output, which are two different things. And I think you have to integrate the output. There's only one. It's either in the loop or it's in the output. You can't integrate the integration or you don't want to. Well, in, in practice, if you if you remember that the robot has mass and it accumulates momentum, then there is another integrator. But Yeah, and it, it generally works in our favor by smoothing out all the bumps. <laughs> but but you, there's no need. You don't want to. If you have a PID library that lets you set the KI, but uh, you don't, I think you don't want to add an integrator outside of it. So, so David, you're saying you always use an integration term. Yeah, is that the question? Yes. Uh, and, and as I, what happened to my camera? It's disabled. It's gone. I didn't do it. There you go. Allow. I'm allowed. <laughs> I'm so pleased when a machine allows me to do something. I'm sorry, Ted, I lost my chain of thought. Uh, no, the, so. the ones that I have used successfully on my robots uh, inside the loop run a proportional and a derivative term. And the output of that loop drives an integrator, an accumulator. And that accumulator uh, scaled appropriately drives uh, the motors directly. So when the output of the PD is a zero, then whatever is in the accumulator currently is the right value. So you still add the output of the loop to it each time around, but the output is now zero. So you're not changing that value. Okay, yes. So I am with you on that, but you, you have to accumulate the output put the um, pig controller to send to the motor because if you don't accumulate the output as soon as you get to the right velocity the the output would shut off if you directly tied it exactly right you can see how with a position controller that's actually what you want right yes once you reach once you reach a position in your cnc machine you have zero error you don't want to move anymore yeah you don't want to move but you can think of the, the location of the head of that CNC machine is like our accelerator. Yep. Yep. Okay. So I am with you on that. <laughs> so, uh, Ted, definitely try out uh, Brett Beauregard's library. It is, it is truly, a, a truly a good one. It's well done. Okay. It's well done. And there's a few of us that can help you with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right. Well, good discussion. Lively, at least. And yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. I think, uh, Ray, you had something to uh, bring up at this point now? Yeah, I um, got a Wii terminal, or Wii-O, I guess is really how you pronounce it. Um, let me see if you can see it. I can crank this down there. And of course, it's too bright. 
Uh, let's see. No, still too bright to see. Anyway, um, it's it's based on the SAMD 51, and it has just a bunch of stuff um, integrated to, with it. Um, it's got uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. The Wi-Fi is at 2.4 and 5 gig. It's got a little five-way uh, button on the front. Um, it's got a three-axis accelerometer, a light sensor, an infrared emitter, micro SD card slot, and a microphone and a buzzer, and two Grove connectors. And it has a 40-pin um, connector. You can actually stick this on the Raspberry Pi 40-pin connector. And I was thinking of using it. I wish you could see it. If you can't really see the line, so it's just too bright. Um, as kind of like a, you know, the user interface, basically, because you can, you can put <laughs> on the, the screen to select through with a five-way button. Oh, yeah, it also has three buttons on top. Um, and it just seemed kind of pretty compact and loaded with stuff. It's got this, you know, the SAMD51 is a pretty fast part. Um, and it was What's the make and model number? Ray, can you put a link in the chat? I am. Um, yeah, sure. I think I can do better. I have something to show you that ties directly into that, actually. Ooh, all right. So, ah, wrong button. Yeah, it's WIO Terminal, and it's made by Seed Studios, S E E E D Studios. Okay, I think this is the one I want. Are you going to? Pull something up, okay. Yeah. Ah, uh, there you go. So, speaking yeah. of that, that's how it yeah. looks. And this was used with this project, which I was like, hmm, as I was looking at it. Ah. So, yes. Yeah. Close. And yeah, it was that that was interesting. And then also the fact that, notice there's no 3D print involved. Yes. With yeah. their base, they use tubes. <laughs> Yep. So, so yeah, this whole article was interesting. Hmm. So, so they're using plumbing fittings, huh? Yeah, that's why I said that was sort of interesting for a couple of reasons. Yeah. Anyway, it's the the WIO W I O There's terminal. That. Yeah, by Seed Seed Studios. So Seed. Studios. I put a link for yeah, you in the chat. I actually have another window with that red, but this ties into that thing, so. But yeah, uh, right yeah, there. there. So, yeah. Yep. Anyway, so I thought it was kind of neat. 36 bucks. It includes a lot of stuff. Yeah, so well, you can see, yeah, this whole list here. Buzzer, phone. Yep. And the the Sam D fifty one is a is a pretty high performance core. Um, I think you can push it up to two hundred megahertz, I think. So you use that, and then a shield. Um, and then here's the circuit bore. So yep. here. So you can drive four motors with it, huh? With that. Yeah. Shield. Yeah. And then yeah. What is a what is a Grove connector? It's or Grove. I don't know who defines Grove. It's it's um. They can be, you know, usually it's VCC ground. And either like a digital output or an analog input, um, or it can be I squared C. Um, so you can have, you know, it's a four pin connector, and you can have, you know, it can supply power and ground and SDA and S clock for I squared C connections. And um, C Studio produces a lot of. A lot of things that you can connect that way. It's kind of like the quick connector um, from SparkFun or Adafruit. They're using on their stuff now. It's you know no soldering required. You just snap these two little connectors together, and you've got four wires that goes you know provides power and 
you know, a communication interface of some sort. Um, you can even have it so it's serial, RX and TX, um, you know, with power and ground. So that's the, you know, the four wires. But um, yeah, this was, it's, it's actually this little program that's running on the display that you can't see because it's so bright, um, is actually spitting out or graphing the accelerometer readings. That, that was one of the programs that you could, you know, example programs. And, you can put up text and boxes and, um, you know, pretty much all the example, There on the case of there, yeah, you see here the speed, the weather, so that's the rental. Yep, yeah. So I thought it was kind of neat. And there's, yeah, the thermal. So yeah, it uh, was a very interesting thing. So Ray, yep. you may want to look at this more closely because they have lots of info on it. Here. Yeah, and the fact that you can, you know, you can uh, set it on a Raspberry Pi or yeah. um, just use that 40 pin connector for whatever connections you want. Um, seemed pretty useful. So, so let me see if I can actually go to the other window now. And the other thing I did, I, I, I was a little afraid that, you know, with shortages and stuff, that stuff, what, you know, I couldn't get stuff, or if I waited a little too long, stuff wouldn't come in. So uh, after John, yeah, so that's oh. somebody else's but, you know, you know, dollars. graphics design. Yeah. So, yeah. so you can do like, um, you know, vertical bars if you want. Um, you can do like analog meter readings where you have a needle that actually scales up and down, um, you know, and I'm sure probably as more people get to use it, there'll be more of that kind of thing. So it's kind of like the Nexium displays. You've got, um, you can create pretty much what you want, wherever you want on that, on that display and, um, you know, interface to things like you would with Nexium with a widget or something uh, where you just provide one value to, you know, to the code and it displays it, you know, moves a bar, moves a needle, that kind of thing. Something uh, you can run a GPS navigator on it and stuff. Yep. Yeah, you can, they have um, a GPS um, device that hooks up to the Grove connectors and, you know, you can, you know, spit out coordinates and that kind of stuff. So, Ray. So, New toy, what are you going to do with it? Bucks. What's that? New toy, what are you going to do with it? Well, um, I'm thinking of using it because it has um, uh, Wi-Fi as kind of a user, you know, remote terminal user interface for the lawnmowers where I can set, you know, like um, that, that pattern that, that uh, I showed you guys that the thing was able to perform um, over and over again, it, it kind of zigzag back and forth, <clears throat> like to put in the number of repeats for the for the pattern, or the distance, or both, and um, just to get some telemetry back, you know, battery readings, that kind of stuff. So um, I thought it was kind of neat. Um, very small package, still reasonably priced. I don't know if they're going to increase the price later on. They probably will, but. Uh, um, and one of the other things that I got were um, a bunch of mechanical parts. I found these. Um, these are solid plastic wheels with a pretty good tread pattern on them. And I think these were like four bucks each. Um, they've got two different size bushings. You can pull the bushing out if you want. If I can get this one out. Okay, this is this wasn't the one that I pulled them out at, but you can pull them out. <laughs> I guess I'll just have to take my word for it. Anyway, so I've got you know bushings, bearings, keyed shaft, um, sprockets that go on it. And um, when I was working, we do uh, my wife and I do grocery pickup. Um, I got a. Let's 
this is a it's a pretty thick plastic bin. This is about probably a little over a half an inch thick there. And um, I'm, I'm guessing it was used in the store somewhere at Albertsons, but I decided to, to grab it. And I'm, I'm gonna use this super thick plastic base because it's very rigid and it was free um, to make a, uh, um, you know, a, a robot that I can do Robo Magellan. And these are, these are gonna be the tires in it. You know, there's no, no slippage because it's a one piece wheel and it's got the pretty aggressive tread on it. Um, got all the, the sprockets and stuff like that. Um, this is 35 chain sprockets that fit on a half inch keyed shaft. So I have most of the parts. Um, I'm waiting for pillow blocks, half inch um, shaft pillow blocks to support it. Um, and I also got um, uh, some 16 inch tires on rims for, um, for the riding mower. I was gonna try something with, um, to basically steer with two brakes on the differential. So if you, if you break, you know, stop one side from rotating, the other side will still rotate and you can use that to rotate or turn the platform basically. And, um, but the tires that I had on were really wide. They were like eight inch wide tires. There wasn't enough shaft left to stick, a, you know, a brake disc on it. Um, so now I have four inch, four inch wide tires of the same height and it should give me plenty of clearance for, uh, you know, to be able to stick the brake on the axle. So, and uh, I've got chains and sprockets for that coming as well. But uh, Anyway, um, yeah, Seat Studio, I think, does have some reasonably priced stuff. Um, they have another device, that, I think it's called the Re-Terminal. Um, a little bit more expensive, I think very new, um, not as well supported, um, but this one seemed to have quite a bit of support. So I, uh, and just all the features, you know, especially the 40 pin Raspberry Pi connector on the back. I thought, you know, that's, a, that's something I want to play with. So anyway, that's all I got. Pretty cool making progress. Uh, Carl, I want to leap in here and point out that you are the only one who got a gold star this evening. Oh, <laughs> I mean, the things, the lengths you have to go to to get a gold star these days, guys. Come on, it's not that difficult. Somebody can do better than this. Somebody needs to do better than this. Chris has enough gold stars for several months worth, but okay, no, thank you. Yeah, I got to take a break. <laughs> Chris has been accumulating them. Rudd, for this inside joke, basically, if anybody can turn on their robot and show it moving at all, we give them a red uh, gold star. And you're muted, uh, Rudd. I, I muted you for the audio. Oh, oh, Rudd, we've been waiting. Somebody, you need to unmute and tell us about that because. Um, set it down and turn it on, and you get a gold star. Somebody had been promising to show the group one of those for the last year and a half, and they haven't done it yet. So you could you could steal their spot and do it. Wow. That's the R U R, isn't it? I think. Yeah, and you're still muted, Rod. I, I I muted you. You'd have to unmute. There we go. So Spheral R V R, and I've been disappointed because it is such a powerful little unit. But Sphero educationally is, is, is edu targets education. Um, but they tend to target more, uh, target more, what do you say, junior high level. Whereas this thing is definitely a high school level type of uh, robot and probably could serve 
as undergrad college robot work. It's, it's a tracked robot. It's got a serial communications port for controlling it from another processor. Um, you can put a processor on board, on, mounted on there, which I have done. Right now, it's just hooked up to my PC because I've been reverse engineering their protocol in C++. They provided Python code, and I don't do Python. Um, it's got an IMU, so it's got an accelerometer, gyroscope. It's got a magnetometer, but as we all know, magnetometers within a robot are problematic. The, uh, the motors and everything else just confuse it. Um, it's got a bunch of LEDs on it. It's got some light sensors, but they're, uh, they're on the bottom. So it's useful if you're driving over a colored pad block, you can tell what color you're on. Not, not terribly useful. Again, that's part of their younger educational thing that you know, somebody can put a red block down there, a red, red pad down there, the robot drives over and when it sees red, it turns right, you know, that type of thing. Um, so I think they haven't pushed it to the market that would really take off. Um, and now they're, they're suffering point shortages, part shortages. Last I looked, you couldn't get one until June 2022. So I don't even know if they're going to be available. Um, even then, they may abandon the whole thing. I don't know. I haven't seen much discussion about them elsewhere. So I haven't, I've been so busy reverse engineering the protocol. The original version of it wasn't too effective as far as driving. Like its slow speed was, uh, they readily admitted after a while, was not uh, not controlled properly. They reversed a new version of this firmware last August, a year ago, August, and I, I missed it. I didn't realize it had been released, but I started working on all the new, the new version of the firmware, you know, a few months ago. And I've got most of it figured out now. So hopefully at some point I'd like to be able to do something with it. Hey, um, I had an unrelated question. The Oak Delight, has anybody responded to how they want the thing shipped yet? They haven't no. sent it out yet. No, I've got one order too, and I haven't. They just had an email that said they were gonna real soon now. <laughs> Put out a survey, I guess. Yeah. About shipping. yeah. I think we had a discussion around what was the best default option on the camera because you have two options. And uh, Carl, can you remember what we chose? Was it the fixed or the autofocus? I think it was the fixed. Yeah. yeah, for a moving robot, I think it was the fix that made sense. Yep. Yeah, but no, I've not received anything either. So yeah, I think they're just not ready yet. Okay. Yeah, the last one it said they were going to send out a survey. I guess they're you know, you're right. to respond with how you want it shipped. First shipments would be in December. Say that again. First shipments will be in December. Yeah. Right. It's, it's so interesting to me how much variance there is between different Kickstarter uh, campaigns. I've done a bunch of them now. I mean, bought a bunch of them now. And some of them, boy, they say it's going to deliver on this date. It comes out at that date. Some of them say, oh, well, we went back into this. Oh, well, we went back into this. Oh, wait, two years later, Harold and I are still waiting for the, uh, the latest Bluetooth DMM oscilloscope thing. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Luxonics yeah, is but, yeah, but we got a date. We got a date any, coming close, man. It's any day close. Now. Yeah, it's yeah. Any day now. It could be. Well, I've got this. I'm on the Kickstarter for the little scout robot. And the only thing I can say about that project is at least they really do a, a good job of communicating the problems they're having with their suppliers and with their manufacturing. And they show, you know, they're they're they they're giving all the information necessary to know why it's delayed rather than just leaving us in the dark so that's that's good that's a good sign the, the ones that get me are the ones where they, they they look good for a while and they beat the thing and they give an update or two and then it's radio silence and then there's 
a year and a half of griping and you never see anything. Well, Lexonix is hedging their bets. If you go to their Discord, they have a whole uh, channel about um, about the shipping uh, about shipping delays, and uh, and they did send out uh, uh, an email to all of the subscribers that that was saying we think we're still on online for December, but stay tuned. So we'll see. Mm. And to be fair, it, everyone's in the same boat. You know, the whole container crisis and all that is like, it's way out of the control of a lot of vendors. Mm -hmm. Well, they had a, a previous version of that. Uh, Kareem, is that the one you have? Sorry, the yeah, oh, the regular Oak D. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I got a, I got one of those, but that's not what the that's not the one I've been messing with the most. I've been using the Intel RealSense. Oh. D four thirty five. Um, so I also have the, I, I did get the Luxonix, um, the Oak D um, a couple weeks ago, but I haven't had a chance to play with it yet. Yeah, didn't someone say the that Intel wasn't going to produce those anymore? Intel isn't producing a lot of the stuff in the, uh, like, the, the extended products that they were investigating in the real sense line, but they are still doing the stereo cameras. Oh, they are. Okay. Yeah. They're not doing the tracking camera going forward. Oh, the, um, I get, it's like and, a 265, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It seems to me that Intel has a long history of doing interesting, uh, often even consumer grade kinds of little experimental products and they run for a while and then they close them down. Yeah, they do that. So does Microsoft. Uh, the the um, uh, Intel also used to uh, be the primary driver of uh, OpenCV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, don't mention the words Edison to me or Zoom. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm, I'm with you, Harold. Yeah. Kareem, that was an Intel D134. The cam, the, sorry, which? The real sense? The real sense? No, it's the D435. 435. Yeah. And there's a D435i that has uh, an, IMU. A, an IMU in it. That's what the I is for. And then they also have a D455, which I ordered a few months ago and they said would ship in October. And I haven't heard anything about it. And it's no longer October. Um, and uh, it's the most expensive of the stereo cameras, and it also has it basically has a, you know, uh, better, uh, uh, deeper uh, field of view in terms of the reliability of the of the depth solutions, um, uh, the and basically twice as deep, and um, also has an IMU on board. Does twice as deep mean four meters instead of two? Yes. That's what it means. I mean, in practice, my uh, 435 um, goes deeper than um, uh, two meters. It goes quite a bit deeper than two meters, but um, what you see is a lot of depth noise once you get past the two meters. So, so the the, the two meters is uh, about the the range where it's you know pretty precise, like within a centimeter of of depth resolution. <laughs> And I haven't characterized the, well, yeah, I really haven't played with the, 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 the Luxonix um, yet. So I can't comment on that one. And hold, hold some comments until later. Yeah. We do the group team re unboxing and then, and then we'll uh, have a free for all. You bet. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm still not sure sure what the difference are the differences are between the Oak D and the Oak D light in terms of like internal hardware. It does look like the Oak D light is smaller, and so the uh, the two stereo cameras are going to be closer together, and it should not have the same capability. So like like the 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 430 the Intel 435 is um, is probably somewhere in between the Oak D light and the and the Oak D in terms of the width of the, the separation of the cameras uh, and the 435 looks about as, as big as the uh, as the Oak D or 
or maybe bigger, more, maybe wider. So, but that, you know, the amount of separation you have uh, plays a huge factor in, in how, how, how deep it's gonna get good resolution. Yeah, I thought the OC light, the camera resolution wasn't as high as the OC. Yeah. That's one of the things that makes it light, you know? Yeah, I'm sure that it's it's that, and it's and it's and it's definitely more compact looking from the photos. And of course, there is a discussion of that comparison for anybody interested. So here's a quick Google search. Um, all right. Well, I typed that. Um, it seems like we're all maybe entering hibernation mode here. <laughs> dark, dreary, rainy weather, no sunlight, at least in Dallas. Curse oh, Murray is wide open. He just wants to go down and do some plumbing in his cold basement. Cold. But uh, what what, uh, what else do we have tonight? Anybody have some other topics to raise? Oh, Pat, Pat. Go ahead. Pat, go ahead, Pat. I've got a... I was going to ask a question of David, but maybe maybe I should just do it on... On the, on the list. Mine's fairly short. It's not, uh, I don't think it's going to be too long. Okay. And then I see uh, Rudd raising his hand after Pat. So let's, let's go ahead, Pat. What you got? Uh, just a quick uh, Can everybody see that? Zoomed in? Yippers. JST connector. Female. Red, red and the black. I need to reverse those two. Has anyone had any luck popping those little metal pins back out and being able to swap wires? I, I did the uh, the only solution I could do after work trying it for like a couple hours is I just cut the wires and re-soldered them on the other side. I actually do that with DuPont connectors and JSTs using one of these really, really sharp uh, pairs of, uh, I guess these are needle nose, twe needle nose tweezers. And you just basically jam the point of the thing into the lock, and then you can pull the wire out. Yeah. Okay. I tried with a pin to, to jam it in and see if I could get it to lock, unlock and pull it out. Well, and had no luck. These are stainless and pretty sharp. You could actually put one into your finger if you're not careful. And uh, But they're hard enough and strong enough that they'll actually push the little lock out of the way. So I do this all the time when I'm reconfiguring my wiring harnesses. Okay. I don't know do it with that, exacto but... knives. I, I, I just cut it and soldered it. <laughs> Who said exacto knives? I did. Yeah. Same thing. You can depress those with an exacto knife point. With an exacto knife. Okay. I've uh, like I say I tried with a pin and I just couldn't get it to go and I didn't I didn't want to break it so I ended up okay well I'll just cut it and solder it. And and an exacto knife and this thing are just equally able to puncture the end of your finger so yay i use a dental pick ah i've, I've still got one finger i can't feel uh, on the tip from using a, a bix punch down tool and i drove the i drove the cutter tip through my finger <laughs> i've used uh jeweler screwdrivers to get in there the very very finest jeweler screwdriver will get in and oh yeah and lift that pin or move it around, push it in actually. Okay. That's actually probably better because I won't snap like the exacto blades do. Mm. Yeah, well, that's I didn't want to. I didn't want to break it, or uh, you know what I mean. I've got I've got a couple, but I don't want to go through everything I had. And like I say, I just ended up cutting it. But I never thought of like the tweezers or uh, something like that. that. You know what I usually try to do? What you guys have done with the uh, pop out those JSTs. I usually can get them out, but then when I put them back in, there's been enough stress on those little connectors that uh, uh, will they will pretty much almost guarantee uh, break off right at the connector, the wiring will. And so I have to just make my own again anyway. I just, you know, I just I usually just cut them off these days, and then uh, you know I've got a, I got lots of those little ends around to do, and I got a very nice pair of crimpers and that made all the difference when making those things i don't have a link because i'm driving down the road or whatever but i i can i can send them out to the, the dprg list 
and okay. the, the, the grippers made myself made it way better and way easier and way more consistent with getting nice good crimps on the JS. So, so Harold, you look like you're in a cheap slasher movie. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple days day late, right? Oh. I got in. Is this right before the aliens descend on this vehicle? I think they just got him. <laughs> a slasher movie. He is. Yeah. David <laughs> <Brown. laughs> and as you see a, a glow in the dark head right behind him in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's already glowing. Wait a minute. Uh, we can fix that. <laughs> Run. Right, I think it looked like you were uh, you were going to pull up your RVR, were you? Yep, we see it. Uh, and you're, you're, muted. you're muted still. If you could unmute. Or we could learn sign language, one of the two, something like that. Still muted. Oh, my goodness. I clicked. Why did I click the button? There's got to be an unclick button. We cannot hear you, Rudd. They got another microphone. I'm not there sure it is. Okay. We, we can hear it. Oh, lights. Fred, action. Gold star. Yeah. <laughs> Very nice. So is that your target for the next week, Rudd, to, to work on the API and, and have some code that moves it around? Get it again. What was that? All right. Is that your target for the next week to work on the API reverse engineer and then have some code to move it around? I've got, yeah, I've just got a little bit more to do. Actually, I could, I could set something up to drive it around now if I wanted, but there's a couple more driving routines and response routines that I need to finish to wrap it all up. Um, but between that and, uh, the behavior tree stuff for next week, we'll have to see which one gets done first. It's, it's all good. It's all good. It's great, great to have a fresh perspective. So welcome. Hope, hope you come back. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, well, swinging around, uh, any other thoughts? Thoughts from the gallery? I have a question. I have a question. I want, I've seen this, and I, I suspect that it's it's just hype, but since I've never, you know, don't own one and don't plan, you know, I'm kind of curious if anybody else has, has already bought one of these or seen this or heard some feedback on it. Let me, uh, I'm going to do a little quick presentation just to show this, the web screen. Has any anybody seen this? It's quote a military grade magnetometer compensation chip, and if you look around, it's it sounds like it's a, one that's very it's a it's a, a specific chip that is really good at. Uh, let's see if I want to make sure this is the right one. Oh yeah, it's that it's that RM3100 sensor right here. And supposedly it's able to to reject noise and and it'd still be a very stable magnetometer sensor. Has anybody heard anything about this? It sounds like you're volunteering to get one and tell us about it, Doug. No, 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 I can't. But I'm just curious if anybody yeah, I else. Vote, I vote he gets one and tells us about it. That's what I vote to. That's what I heard. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't go that way. I was just wondering if anybody had, uh, had, anybody, had, had anybody had run into that. The I only thing a lot of support for this endeavor, a lot of support here. Yeah. <laughs> I just did a search on that, and there is a paper um, by Leonardo Regoli. Mark Moldwin, 
Matthew Pelloni, basically an academic paper that investigates that particular sensor. So if you Can do you a search on, on the sensor name, there's actually a paper about six links down that actually talks about an investigation into it. So, well, Rick, can you put that link in the, in the chat? Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm not. I can send it into the mail list. It's on the other computer. Maybe I can find it again. I'll try. Um, What's the title? Um, it's oh, the title is um, "Investigation of a Low-Cost Magneto Inductive Magnetometer for Space Science Applications," and the first name is Regoli, R-E-G-O-L-I, Leonardo Regoli. And it's like if you do a search on M3, RM3100 magnetometer, it's down the list. Um, it's about six links down. Investigation of, you should see it. Researchgate.net. No, it's DNB info. I'll, I'll, I've got the link here. Oh, here is the second one in, in my search term. And here there we go. Is. Just pasting it in. I can get it there. Doug, where did you run across that? Uh, that company, uh, let's see, what's the name of the company? That I bought was an Amazon link. Yeah, that was an Amazon link, but the WIT motion, uh, is, uh, it's a company in China that makes a lot of I IMUs. Uh, if you recall, um, when I was, I showed my plans for another year, I said, I, I'm also looking at another IMU. Well, they make six degrees and nine degrees IMUs and several other combinations of things. They have one with a GPS already built into it. Uh, so if you go on Amazon and look up at uh, either this link or or Whip Motion, W I just posted the link. Okay, that that'll uh. You can find a whole bunch of things on on that that's by that vendor that look really interesting. I have one of their, I just have one of their six degree of freedom modules that I was going to put on my test module to, as an alternative for the BNO uh, 155 just to see how it did. Uh, they're not necessarily cheaper than a BNO, but uh, they have a nice little box and it's kind of cute. And I, but this caught my eye when I was looking at their product line. They put this in one of their, their what they call their military grade nine degree of freedom IMU. So, uh, and I also, I believe that's in the one when they do the GPS, but I'm not sure about that. The GPS module with a nine degree of freedom, if I recall, is about $129. So anyway, so I, I wanted to try the six degree of freedom, see how it worked. I had a little buyer's remorse because I could have got for like two dollars more, I could have gotten the one with their magnetometer, but I think it's I I don't think it's uh that good of a magnetometer. I don't know, we'll find out. It has worry free support though. <laughs> Yeah, they don't have a worry in the world. <laughs> they got your money. <laughs> no, actually, like actually, if you look at their, I think their reviews, they apparently they are very good with their customer service. Uh, the reviews mention that over and over again. Now, I don't know if the guys over in China writing those reviews are saying that or just if it's real, but you know how it is. It is what don't it worry, is. Be happy. Yeah. Well, the one thing I got, it's an SPI device, and it has a lifetime friendly customer service mm -hmm. and small noise. Mm -hmm. So I like the small noise part. Yeah. Small. Small noise. Small noise. It's all relative. nano NT, nano something. Anyway. Nano Tesla? Way beyond me on this one. Nano T's, whatever. And lowercase and uppercase t 15 nano somethings per at 200 cycle count so you know mm -hmm. but i'm just saying uh be interesting to see 
Mm. I'd like to see that particular paper that Murray found. Maybe I, I posted the link to it, Doug. It's, it's okay. in the chat. Okay. In good. the chat. Yep. See what cool. it says. See what it says. Yeah. Because it would be not, you know, we've seen, I know everybody here in the last five years has seen such an upgrade in sensors and things that were available to the hobbyists. So why not, why not a magnetometer that's really, you know, noise resistant? Could happen, you know. And it's military grade, which is cool. The next thing is to put weapons on your robot. Which military is the yeah. question? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then you still have to. You know, have, um, is the military grade enough to survive our own construction and use? Yeah, well, military military grade. I mean, I don't know exactly what that means because in the software world, they have this thing called bank grade encryption, which really means that they're just a bunch of buzzwords that somebody threw together, and it actually doesn't make any any sense at all. It just makes it where there's a checkbox on somebody's list somewhere that and, and then they don't really have a definition of what bank grade encryption is so i'm wondering if this military grade thing has the same kind of deal and yes i'm being an old grumpy old man on this just because i've seen it a number of times so well, well, often, actually... often that just means that it's got the you know, like temperature and shock ranges you know so if it's if it's talking purely about the hardware it, it just might mean that it's got a bigger operating envelope than uh, consumer grade stuff, which would also, be nice. In the before time when something was called mill spec, that really just meant that they went through all the regular parts and tested it. And the ones, the, that, ones. Yeah, the ones that fell within a narrow range. You can do that yourself if you go out and buy a couple dozen parts. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't agree with that all the time because when I was designing mill spec circuits for TI, I mean, the, the, there were specific specifications that an individual part would be assigned, would be rated against would or designed be, yeah. for. You know, it might be hermetically sealed packages. It might be temperature range. It might be susceptibility or resistance to radiation for space applications. So, rad hard. Yeah, but yeah, but without without any of the other stuff, to me, it's. It's, it's as everyone else is saying, it's just marketing mumbo jumbo. Doesn't mean squat until you look at what it, just any, what if any specs are really called out. And considering this is a product from China, sold in China, it's not likely to be American mill spec. It's could be the New Zealand military, you know. <laughs> well, I don't know. China does have supersonic nuclear missiles now, and hypersonic. We don't. <laughs> Canada has five submarines, and two of them float. Oh, damn. Well, one of them won't float if you untie it. <laughs> the question is, can they not float? Or are they always floating? We, we bought them from Britain, so one of them kept sinking, so they tied it to the dock. The other three were, were junk, and they got one that's running around, I don't know, in that bay in Halifax or something. <laughs> They take kids on board for five dollars. That's right. <laughs> exactly. But it's mill spec, right? Yep. Hundred <laughs> percent. So, right. I probably don't want to um, start a whole new uh, uh, debate. <laughs> but going back to some of the emails, uh, so so maybe it's just a like a warning, a shot across the bow. Uh, I can I can maybe send something um out to the list about a, a proposition that um ballistic behaviors within uh, within within specifically uh um uh, uh, sort of david's definition um isn't it, isn't it likely that they can all be recast as servo behaviors with the right sensor construction virtual sensor construction yes my answer is absolutely, and that it's not only right, but it that it's preferable. Right, exactly. It's absolutely. Yes. So there really is no need for the idea of a ballistic behavior. Well, there are some places where you actually have to use it. 
you, you can't get by without. But well, like turning sense, on a robot, yeah. <laughs> in, the sense that, uh, in the sense that you can get by without them, I, I would say that you should. Well, even the vaunted, uh, vaunted, uh, the, the, the typical example is your bumper behavior, right? Um, that's not a ballistic behavior, right? It's a bumper, the bumper initiates a, um, I, w I would say you could, if you're reconstructing it as a servo behavior, the bumper is initiating a virtual sensor that gives a new target of elapsed time or elapsed distance or elapsed loop count or whatever it is. Um, and, uh, and, that, and that opens up a, an escape behavior. Right, so even there, it's you don't need a ballistic behavior. No, I agree. I agree. You'd have to explain that so I could understand it because I didn't get that. Okay, ballistic a bit behaviors in the concept, in the context of subsumption, bad. I got that. Bad. <laughs> bad. Reactive behaviors, servoid behaviors, good. Okay, so let's pose a problem, which is. The robot has bumped into something, and we want it to back away from that and then go a different direction. Now, how would you do that without ballistic, as we've defined it? You would create a, you would initiate a virtual sensor that you've constructed that has that. Uh, I'm not trying to expand the, the nomenclature too much here, but you know mm -hmm. the, the uh, objective-oriented or goal-oriented type of uh, approach. Um, can be accomplished by simply creating a constructing a virtual sensor that, that that gives you a continuous signal up until the point where it has achieved what it thinks it need, you're wanting to achieve right and mm -hmm. so while you're executing on that virtual sensor it is a regular servo behavior or reactive behavior so what is the potential states of this new servo virtual sensor um, Doug, let me try to simplify that if I can. I, yeah. I agree with everything that Kareem just said. Yeah. I would uh, I would use as an example not a whole bumper behavior, but just the example I recently posted of a ballistic behavior that rotated through a certain angle. Mm -hmm. So that would be ballistic. You're told to go through an angle and don't stop until you have get to, to that, end. or you're interrupted. So, yeah. You're changing the topic, Doug. Well, I'm just trying to, I'm just, you know. <laughs> or you're interrupted, it doesn't belong here. Yeah. <laughs> so let's say we so just have. So if we did that instead as a servoing behavior, as Kareem suggested, instead of rotating through a certain angle, yeah, you would rotate to a given heading, irrespective of what the angle is. Yeah, so sort, of like a, sort of like a temporary waypoint then. Huh? Yes. So that if you over rotated that heading yeah. you would rotate back toward it right now if you are subsumed during the course of that it yeah. doesn't matter <coughs> but when the subsumption ends you're still going wherever you are whatever position you're in you're still going to try to rotate until you have that heading not for a specific angle right. the ballistic behavior would rotate through a specific angle but the servoing behavior is seeking a specific angle heading so uh, as kareem suggests the three behaviors that we normally associate with a bumper which is to back up rotate and go forward could all be recast as servo behaviors that are in point of fact reacting to the environment rather than just operating ballistically yeah well, the problem uh, with ballistic behaviors in the context of subsumption is that they can't really be subsumed it breaks them when you subsume them and that's why they are to be avoided if possible. Yeah. And I, I think that in the in previous discussions around this and in the mailing list, we've all kind of agreed that on on some basic principles, like this idea that that ballistic behaviors as defined could be interrupted, and that, that's a good thing. They need to be interrupted by whatever. So I don't think, and this is what I said in the email to Kareem, is I don't think that we really disagree, except maybe terminologically, about some of these things. But I still quite, and because you know, I had this idea of even a macro, and, I, and the macro was triggered by a bumper, and then the macro would operate kind of in what I think you're saying, David, that it would try to make the robot 
change its behavior for a certain amount of time, but that certain amount of time now is then the ballistic time. And that's what I'm trying to avoid. But if we go to more of what Rudd's talking about with this idea of different goals, that what you would do is you would shift from the current goal, whatever that is, the generic goal, to a goal that says, get away from this object. So for a certain amount of time, until we could find out that we were away from this object that we bumped into, we would change the goal, which would change the robot's overall behavior until that's finished, and then it would start up again into its normal mode. Is that quite close? The only only part of that I would object to is that in the, in the context of subsumption, and I've learned that I have to begin all my sentences that way, in the context of subsumption, uh, ballistic behaviors break when they're subsumed. So Agreed. if you try to subsume one, the really only option is for it to abort. And you made that point in the mail, and I think that's good. That's under, understood. In the subsumption environment, when something is subsumed, it's not halted. It doesn't stop running. So when it stops being subsumed, it needs to be able to pick up from wherever it is, not from wherever it wants. And because of this, as I say, that in my experience, if ballistic behaviors in a subsumption context are subsumed, their only real option is to abort. Right. Agreed. But otherwise, I, I don't disagree with, with what you said in the context of subsumption. <laughs> <laughs> but but we and, 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 and outside of the context of subsumption, we don't we try not to even use those terms, right? So, uh, I, and I'm talking again uh, purely about my team, right? Uh, but I don't my, disagree. My program, yeah. You don't okay. really have a need for that definition because you guys are not doing subsumption, right? Yeah, but we still have goal-oriented behaviors that are uh, either self-term that that can be self-terminating and might still. Uh, need to be interrupted or suppressed. So we don't typically use the word zoom, but we might suppress one behavior from another behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all constructed as, as, as uh, state machines that aren't necessarily, there's still room for um, emergent behaviors. Um, it's, not, it's not like subsumption is the only way you can get to emergent behaviors. Um, but uh, because, we're, because we're doing robots that are, um, that are not just moving platforms, but they may have uh, a shooter that has to independently, you know, rotate. Uh, it may have a gripper mounted on the shooter that goes in and out. And uh, like last year, we had uh, uh, an intake mechanism that could conflict with an extern with with a with a, uh, a deployed gripper, right? Where they could contact each other, right? We've got to think about um, we've got to construct it as a bunch of subsystems that are. Uh, potentially in conflict with each other. Uh, and we're just not bright enough to figure out how to do that with some subsumption. Bee trees. Maybe. <laughs> well, I'm actually really excited with Rudd bringing those ideas in because I've been, as you know, struggling around these edges because like every one of my, I've got a publish and subscribe model and there's events flying all over the place and any any behavior can either suppress or release an existing behavior or enable or disable. I've actually got both of those flags. And so suppression is basically a temporary thing and disabled. Usually when something's been disabled, it doesn't get enabled ever again until I turn the robot on, but um, or off and on again. Um, but the idea of having some kind of a higher level control is where I've been struggling. And that's kind of where the ballistic thing comes in, because that's at the level of goal seeking. You're trying to do something very specific, like away from a, you know, back away from something, or find a doorway, or. But those higher level, I've been kind of struggling for a paradigm of what that might be, and you don't really get that in the traditional, like the Brooks papers of subsumption. It's more like put a bunch of stuff together, turn on the robot, and let it go. And there's not that idea of levels of behavior. And so I've been kind of find, trying to find my way, you know, to something that's, that I haven't found an easy definition of that I could implement. Well, so I, would, I would ask you to drop the use of the term ballistic for that kind of thing, uh, just to make it easy <laughs> on all of us. Well, I, I've learned my lesson. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I like I like goal or objective oriented, not object oriented, but objective oriented. Uh, goal uh, is a great word. I'm gonna use goal. I'm just okay. stay away from the B word from now on. <laughs> well, I think what same... Rudd suggested earlier today is something worth thinking about. That these are important fact. Um, what's the right word here? They're sub units of a larger way of organizing things. Gentlemen, I, I have to bid you very farewell this evening. Likewise, you, David. And yeah. uh, unless anyone else wants to jump in, I propose on that note we call it a good night and crawl in our caves and wait till spring. And See, I don't need to follow up on the list now. But we have no. Dave's an email. There you no, go. No, no, we're good. Yeah. Old style email. <laughs> All right. Good night, Bye. guys. Good day.